Hello and welcome to the Idaho Reports podcast. I'm Logan Finney. Joining me this week is Colin Eagles Smith with the US Geological Survey to talk about a recent study involving fish and mercury levels in the Snake River. The Snake River has been in the news a lot recently with the recent detection of quagga mussel larvae in the river and the fish kills from the treatment of those uh, quagga mussels, but that's not the only ecological issue going on in this river that impacts so much of Idaho. So Colin, uh, how about you introduce yourself in the work that you do with the U.S. Geological Survey? Okay, thank you, Logan. Um, yeah, so I'm Colin Eaglesmith with the U.S. Geological Survey. I'm a research ecologist in Corvallis, Oregon, uh, and our research group works uh, a lot on, on uh, contaminant um, issues across the U.S., and especially we have, we have a lot of expertise in mercury cycling and mercury bioaccumulation in aquatic ecosystems. Um, so, so this project and this this paper that came out, uh, led by Dr. James Williker and, and my group, um, looked specifically at mercury levels in smallmouth bass throughout the extent of, of most of the Snake River, um, and focusing specifically on compares, comparing mercury concentrations in reservoirs, uh, the, the tail races or the downstream extent below reservoirs, and then free-flowing stretches of the Snake River to get a better understanding of how the mercury concentrations vary through, through that system. And so what was the inspiration for this study and the, the questions that you wanted to answer? What, what about the Snake River made this the right place to look at this kind of information? So the motivation was a partnership that we had with Idaho Power Company, um, and we've been working on a research project with them in the Hell's Canyon Reservoir Complex uh, for several years. And um, as part of that research, we wanted to expand out and look at whether Hell's, you know, how Hell's Canyon compared to the rest of the Snake River itself and to other reservoirs within the Snake River. And so can you remind us what exactly the scope of the Snake River is? Because it's a big river system. It's the biggest tributary of the Columbia. It goes all the way from Washington to Oregon and spans east to west through Idaho and much of the north-south area as well. Can you give us just a little bit of perspective on how big of a watershed this is? Yeah, it's it's tremendous. I guess I can I can talk more about the the, the scope that that we studied, which was from about American Falls Reservoir, um, you know, up, upstream all the way down to uh, below Hell's Canyon Dam, so into the Hell's Canyon Complex or Hell's Canyon stretch of the the Snake River um, uh, to Pittsburgh Landing. And so we did that, that that stretch below there that that extends down to um, you know, the intersection, the border with Washington and Oregon. We did not go as far downstream as that. But still, from Pittsburgh Landing almost at Lewiston all the way to American Falls, that's a pretty that's a pretty big stretch. That I imagine it, that was a lot of work. It was a lot of work, yeah. Um, so we and we did sampling in, in 2013, 2015, and 2020. So multiple years of of sampling as well went into this. And so, how exactly do you collect this data? And I guess what exactly are we measuring when you when you guys are doing this study specifically? It's measuring um, the presence of mercury in in the river system. Yeah. So uh, we're again working with Idaho Power Company uh, and their um, environmental departments. They they do annual fish surveys throughout the extent of, of much of the Snake River system. And so we partnered with them, and they did a lot of fish sampling for us. Um, and then we take a, a, a segment of the fish, we'll take a muscle sample and analyze that muscle um, for the content of mercury, the amount of mercury in that muscle relative to the, the amount of actual muscle tissue there. It gives us a, a concentration of mercury that's in that tissue. And so how does the mercury get into the fish in the first place? What sort of, what sort of systems are you looking at here in the reservoirs versus the free flowing sections of the river that, that can affect uh, the mercury concentration in the fish? So that's, that's a great question. Um, and, and mercury is, is sort of uniquely complicated as a, as a contaminant or as a, an element in the ecosystem. Um, so mercury in its inorganic form is the most common form, and that can be deposited in watersheds and airways from the atmosphere. It can also come from mining. Um, and most of the, the, of the mercury that we see in the environment does come from atmospheric deposition. Um, and it gets into the atmosphere from things like coal burning or um, or using mercury in gold mining, uh, and it, it distributes globally. Um, it's when the mercury lands in, in aquatic systems, so in, in rivers, lakes, streams, that sort of thing, there's a process by which the mercury, we, we call it methylation, but it, I, I like to refer to it as, as the mercury gets activated by, by microbes and it gets changed into a different form, and we, that, that form is called methylmercury. And that form of methylmercury 
is more bioavailable, so it can enter um, biological cells more easily than the more common inorganic form that deposits on, on waterways. And it takes specific environmental conditions for the microbial groups to be able to convert that mercury from inorganic to methylmercury. So in other words, to activate that mercury, they require um, unique environmental characteristics to, 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 for the, the microbes to function properly. Sure. And I think reading kind of the the abstract for the study, it spoke about um, anoxic conditions in, in lower parts of, of the water. Um, our our audience may be familiar. We've we've done some coverage of Lake Coeur d'Alene and the mining waste up there, uh, where their concern is not so much mercury, but the concern is lead in the sediment up there that's kept by um, that's kept in place by the oxygen and anoxic can, conditions would cause some issues up there as well. Yeah. Is, is that the same kind of, kind of mechanism going on here? It's a different mechanism, but, um, the, the microbial groups, so the microbes that actually convert, that, that activate the mercury and create methylmercury, most of them only can exist in anoxic conditions. So they require, um, low or no oxygen for, for them to, to make a living and, and, and to exist. And so what we've seen in other systems uh, across the world really is, when you have anoxia, that tends to be one of the triggers for creating methylmercury in the environment. And so re many reservoirs and, and lakes, natural lakes, um, seasonally will stratify. And so you'll have um, a layer of warm water on top, and that sits on top of the layer of cold water, and they, they don't mix over time. And you can have that because of the lack of mixing, the oxygen in the lower portions of the, of, of the reservoir can become anoxic. Um, and when that happens, it may facilitate or trigger the, the formation of methylmercury and, and activate those microbial communities. And so that was one of the questions that we were asking is, um, do we see any sort of association between re reservoir stratification and mercury concentrations in the fish? What did you guys find? Did that, did that correlate? Did that pan out? So we did, we found, so we compared reservoirs with free flowing stretches of the Snake River. Um, and we found that concentrations in fish were about twice as high across in, in all reservoirs on average than they were in the free flowing sections of the Snake River. Uh, and then when we looked within individual reservoirs, there are a number of reservoirs in the Snake River system that don't stratify. So they remain mixed all year long. And there are a number of reservoirs that do stratify. And so we compared those two and found that the, the fish in the reservoirs that do stratify had constant mercury concentrations that were about twice as high as the fish um, in reservoirs that don't stratify. And if we if we break that out into three categories, so stratifying reservoirs, non-stratifying, and then free flowing, how much of a difference is there between those three? Uh, it's about I think about a threefold difference um, between the free flowing and the stratified reservoirs. If we look at the the two extremes. And there are there are a lot of dams on the Snake River. I was I was just looking at a map of it earlier, and it's it's pretty impressive. And some of them are federal dams, some of them are private dams, some of them are used for irrigation, some of them for hydroelectricity, some for both. How can you can you tell us how much of the river is dammed versus free flowing, and and how does how does that kind of break out? Yeah, that it's it's a hard one to to quantify because I think you know, the extent of what is and isn't a reservoir is is a little bit um a little bit fuzzy, but um at least in our study area, about 75% of the length of, of area that we studied could be classified as a reservoir. Um 20% we classified as a tail race. So the tail race being the section immediately below the reservoir. And then about six percent of the extent was we classified as free flowing. So there, yeah, there are about twenty-three dams and reservoirs that that we looked at in in our study through the Snake River. And so that that tail rise part specifically that you're talking about, that's the shorter stretch of the river where water is being released downstream of the dam. Is that is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Yep. And so did you did you see any particular effects of mercury concentration in that part below these dams as well? Was there anything worth uh, highlighting from that? Yeah, we, we saw a pretty consistent pattern um, similar to what we saw in the reservoirs, and, and that is the, the fish in the tail race sections below stratified reservoirs tended to have higher concentrations than fish below reservoirs that didn't stratify. Um, and we could, in stratified reservoirs, we could see that signal. It didn't, didn't return to a free-flowing um, sort of concentration until about 25 or, or so miles Below the, below the dam. So it continued down fairly for a fairly large distance. 
Are there any specific reservoirs worth mentioning that you guys studied that stand out as examples in particular of a stratifying or non-stratifying reservoirs? I don't know if there are any specific reservoirs. I, I think that we have the most data from Brownlee Reservoir, um, Oxbow Reservoir, and Hell's Canyon because that was part of a, a, another larger study. Um, um, and all of those have some form of stratification that occurs. Uh, and then CJ Strike was another reservoir that, that we studied fairly intensively. And so when we're talking about this mercury that in these conditions is uh, more prevalent and in a form that is more readily taken up into these fish. Um, what what sort of fish were you guys studying? Was this a broad look? Was this one particular species? And and if it was, why did, why pick one species over over a different one? Right, that's a great question. Um, so we focused exclusively on small smallmouth bass, uh, and we did that for for a number of reasons. One is that there there are differences among species and so if, if you're looking at mercury at one location in bluegill and in another location in smallmouth bass it might be hard to make comparisons between the two locations so we wanted a, a consistent species that that was present throughout the entire system uh, smallmouth bass is one spe one such species that that we could collect and we, we could find in all of these these locations so that that allowed us to provide an apples to apples comparison through the extent of the, the snake river um, it's also an invasive species. So from a conservation perspective, we weren't so we weren't collecting or, or taking any sort of native species um, as well. And then it's a really uh, a regularly harvested species um, and one that that a lot of uh, that sport fishers target and, and and like to fish for. So there were some there's a linkage to human health, to human health consumption because people do fish for smallmouth bass and eat them as well. Yeah, that's a perfect transition. Can you tell me a little bit about the health effects of mercury and why this is a, a concern that we're looking out for and studying? Yeah, so so in, in elevated concentrations and, and with, with a lot of, of um, exposure to mercury, um, it's a neurotoxin, so it can affect, um, you know, can affect your, your nervous system, um, it can affect your co cognitive ability. It also has cardiac effects, so it can, can influence um, heart function as well. And um, it's one of the most common contaminants that occur worldwide. And um, so at, at elevated exposure, it can, it can have deleterious effects and especially in children and fetuses. And so a lot of the, um, a lot of the consumption guidelines and, and human health guidance are, are centered around protection of, of women of childbearing age and, and children um, as, as they're developing neurologically, it can, it can impact uh, those functions. And so even though this particular study in this particular area only looked at this one species, smallmouth bass, which is a, a popular sport fish, can, can you extrapolate these findings to um, the region more broadly? Or I guess I, a better way to phrase that is even though you used one fish for consistent measurement, mm -hmm. um, what sort of picture does that give us of the, the ecosystem overall? Good, good question. So um, it can be difficult to, to, estimate mercury concentrations in another species from, from bass. Um, but it, what it does allow us to do is, is identify locations and, and, and essentially say if mercury in smallmouth bass is low in location A in, in smallmouth bass, it'll probably be low in other species in that location. In, in contrast, if it's high in location B, we would expect that it would be high in, in um, other species that occur in location B. So, so it, it provides an, an opportunity for us to, to gauge the potential exposure and health risks that we, we might see along different stretches of the river. And so then how are the findings from this study and, and ones like it, how are those results then used for policymakers when they're deciding things like hunting and fishing regulations or things like uh, fish consumption advisories? What, what happens now that this study has been published? Right. So um, we've released all the data that the data are made available to, to um, decision makers and public health authorities, and they can take the, the, the data that we have, look at the, the, purport, the average concentrations of different locations and the proportion of fish and compare them to benchmarks of, of, um, of health risk in different states and, and different federal agencies. Um, there, there are varying degrees of, of benchmarks that are used, but they can they can take that information and make some decisions on whether or not um, it's, it's valuable to communicate the potential for potential consumption advisories or communicate whether there's a health risk to humans from, from consuming fish at different locations.
right. Colin Eagle Smith, research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. Thanks so much for your time this week. All right, Logan, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Presentation of Idaho Reports on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Hi, I'm Marcia Franklin, the producer and host of Dialogue. For more than 25 years, we've been bringing you conversations that matter. More than 150 of those conversations are with writers, and now you can take them with you wherever you go, while you're walking, around the house, or in the car. Just search for Dialogue with Marcia Franklin on Apple Podcasts and other podcast platforms, and remember to subscribe so that new shows download automatically. Enjoy.